and we are recording and this is right. episode seven uh or interview seven of this special 2021 uh grand lodge candidates series uh so welcome uh brother derek mcnulty thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here so this is the um well the, we're recording this um on the friday but this is being this will be the seventh episode released in a row of this series so everybody who's been watching this and please go check them all out will have heard this spiel before so i'll make it very quick uh this invitation is open to all grand lodge candidates if for whatever reason I wasn't able to get in touch with you, um, and I did have a few emails bounce back to me, things like that, my email is on the bottom of the screen. Look down, uh, email me, get in touch with me, and I will make sure to have you as part of the podcast. All opinions expressed on my own or the guests. Uh, they don't, we don't speak for Grand Lodge or the Windsor Masonic Temple. And these interviews are not meant as uh, endorsements of any one candidate, just a chance to get to know them better, both in terms of their Masonic journey and their specific kind of reasons for standing and running. And if you check the description to this video, you will see some rules regarding voting in 2021 for any Ontario Grand Lodge members who are watching this, and also uh, some information about the brother from uh, Grand Lodge that was sent to us. And with that, once again, thank you so much for being here. Thanks. It's a real pleasure. Uh, hopefully it's a beautiful day where you're at. Uh, it's a nice day up here in, uh, in Grimsby, Ontario. And uh, um, yeah, it's great to, to participate in uh, in something like this, uh, especially given I don't that, think uh, I've ever been to Grimsby, Ontario before, as I try to think you probably uh, drove drove through it <laughs> or buy it, I should say. But uh, tell me, I mean, I love learning about kind of small towns throughout Ontario, anywhere really, and, and especially ones I haven't been to. Um, how are things in Grisby? Is there is the Masonic uh, Lodge and Temple located in Grimsby proper, or is it uh, outside of it? So there's a number of smaller communities around uh, the area, Binbrook, uh, Grimsby, um, uh, Fruitland, that sort of thing that um, that have their own small lodges uh there is a lodge literally downtown grimsby um i'm right right now i'm the worshipful master of croy lodge up in uh in thornhill in uh, toronto don valley district uh but we live in grimsby so uh i, I would say I, I would commute typically for lodge but uh that's that's been <laughs> not happening in the last you know over a year but uh um yeah grimsby ha grimsby number seven union lodge number seven uh it's been around it's one of the oldest lodges in in our jurisdiction uh and a, a very storied lodge from what i understand um some significant uh, founders in the region uh and of the province uh of the niagara area especially uh were members of of the lodge here and they're obviously their names uh streets and stuff named after some of these pillars but typically of of the day any community that was organized you know uh in the 19th or 17th century your your roads are named after prominent people and politicians and of course uh, many of those were were brothers and grimsby's uh, no exception to that um Nell nelly's being one of them uh and uh yeah so it, it's kind of neat to be in uh a, i guess you would call it a quasi rural area um but uh, just some tremendous Masonic history here, which I, I can't wait to get into more. You know, small town uh, Freemasonry or, or smaller town, whether it be Thornhill or Grimsby or, or kind of the, the smaller communities, um, that's such a unique characteristic of Freemasonry is, is the, the connection that sometimes a Masonic Lodge will have to a smaller town. That you don't always see necessarily in a, a larger city. Um, not to say that there's a connections there uh, as well, but it's just an interesting. It's just a unique thing, you know, kind of the the flavor of Freemasonry in a smaller town or a rural setting. Agreed, agreed. Uh, and, and it's always nice to go to to these lodge buildings because many of them, um, if they're not the first, they're like the second building, perhaps. 
uh, I've been around for pr over a hundred years and, uh, um, the, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, yeah, over a hundred years and, and that lodge building might, uh, or likely only host a, a single lodge. Whereas when you get into the larger cities, uh, and, and in masonry in, in other countries that tends to happen where there's a, a single lodge building where all the lodges meet. Uh, so in, in uh, Toronto Don Valley District, uh, there's two lodge buildings where 18 lodges meet. Um, other districts have, you know, more lodge buildings to get, to get around to, more tra more like geographical traveling, if you will. Um, perhaps the same number of, of lodges or a similar number, but not quite uh, as many locations to travel to. So, so in that sense, it's easy enough in, in Don Valley, you only have to worry about the two buildings in terms of figuring out where you want to go if you're traveling within the district. Uh, but the great thing uh, as you get out of the big city is just about every borough would probably have uh, a lodge or two buildings. Um, so I know there's, a, you know, Hamilton has a two or three buildings. If It depends on sort of where you draw the line in Hamilton. Uh, unfortunately, Stony Creek just sold their uh, their temple, and they sort of either moved to Stony Creek, or sorry, moved to Hamilton or or uh, um, Burlington for the lodges that were housed there. Um, but yeah, it's it, it's a, re a neat thing, and, and I think uh, it'd be interesting to take a poll because some people consider the the expression "country lodge" as a bit of an insult. Um, I personally see it as a, as a mark of uh, distinction. Uh, but like you say, the small town lodges uh, tend to be older. They, they, believe it or not, they just seem to last a little bit longer. Less seems to be less amalgamations anyway. But maybe that's because they're further apart. But uh, yeah. Well, the the travel, like you pointed out, right? There's it's definitely a unique experience. Um, you know, visiting uh, northern jurisdiction lodges or or small town lodges. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you hear about district deputies, you know, it, it's, it's, you know, a, a five, six hour drive between lodges in some cases or having to, you know, stay overnight at a, uh, at a worshipful master's house or something to complete a, a tour because it really is like a, a tour, you know, you're not going to the same building on different nights, you're going from town A to town B sometimes in some very interesting weather, I'm sure, in those Northern communities to get the chance to visit, um, you know, these these Masonic lodges. I think it harkens back to the old days too. Like if you think back to like uh, our first half century or century uh, before um, large roads were built, uh, when you went to Grand Lodge, that you it was three days because it wasn't worth traveling just for one day. I mean, obviously there's a lot of business to conduct, but you know, you would, you, you, you traveled, you stayed, whether you were billeted or stayed in a hotel or whatever. Um, but it, it, it was, you know, you went away for uh, for the grand communication. Uh, and, and Ontario is no different than any other jurisdiction. It's the same uh, same way. So it's it's uh, it's kind of neat that there's there's still a connection there. I, I'm sure some people find it a bit of a pain in the butt to travel uh, long distances just to sort of get to a lodge, but. Uh, um, and I, and I understand that, uh, some of the more, um, disparate, uh, jurors, uh, districts are looking to find a way to, uh, want to attract qualified personnel's DDs, but also, uh, t um, it's difficult to do that in a year. So perhaps like a two year appoint, uh, election, et cetera, might, might, uh, serve the ticket, but, uh, you know, certainly in Southern Ontario for the most part. Um, I don't think that's a, a big problem, even as you move further, like out of the bigger cities, you know, uh, you know, between Windsor and, and Cambridge, you know, like in Aylmer or something like that. I mean, you're not that far from the big city, whether it's Windsor or, or Cambridge or even Hamilton for that matter. But uh, like you say, get up to the Manitoba border and you could be spending a couple hours to get to Lodge and, you know. Uh, easy, uh, easily. Yeah. To, to what extent, you know, we talk about travel and, and you brought up Grand Lodge uh, mm -hmm. and this has been brought up in, in a few other of these interviews. Um, to what extent, uh, uh, you know, do you view, so it's one thing for a brother or brethren to travel to Grand Lodge, you know, it, the annual communications normally held in person at the Royal York versus, um, you know, Grand Lodge traveling 
to some of these more northern, more 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 smaller towns, um, you know, what would you think about a a roaming Grand Lodge where it's actually going to different once we can meet in person again? Is you know attending different communities and different locations, um, uh, and maybe that would also and that's the type of travel too, but it also give a chance for you know brother who maybe can't make the trip normally for whatever reason, especially when you're talking about Kenora and you're talking about, you know, the, the other time zone um, or where the other time zone, everyone to put it uh, of Ontario to take part in some of these events. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's a great question. And obviously it's a matter of uh, great debate. Um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm non-committal, but I, I could make an ex uh, reasoning for both, uh, keeping it in person in a central location. Um, I think the answer is either rotating, like you say, to help uh, jurisdictions feel included uh, and m sort of much like a shrine would, if you will, like when the shrine ceremonials come to town, right? They rotate every year. So there'll be, uh, and I can speak for Ramisi Shrine, and I'm, I'm, I'm sure... Uh, Mocha and Tunis do the same thing that, uh, um, you know, you might have grant, uh, your communication in in the spring in one city and, and maybe the the capital or the headquarters uh, on the other season, whether that's fall or spring or something. Right. So. Uh, so it's possible because what happens is a lodge sponsors it and organizes it. Right. Or, or in this case, a club. But uh, could lodge do that? Could we expect that? Uh, I, I think a lodge or a district anyway um, could host it. Uh, the only question would be, uh, where are the facilities most appropriate? I mean, if you look at uh, the Grand Masters Banquet in Toronto, I mean, we're talking anywhere from three to 500 attendees really, right? Um, do we have that size banquet facility in Kenora, if you will, right? Um, and uh, so, yeah, so that would be that would be a question, Ken. So, do the facilities exist outside of uh, the larger cities? I mean, obviously, Ottawa, Hamilton, but even if if we did that, if we started, uh, you know, going to Windsor and London and and Toronto and Hamilton and Ottawa and then Thunder Bay or or something like that and rotate, I think it's feasible. Uh, if not, in, I think it's important to try and include the brethren uh, in the, uh, what I would use the expression, outports, right? The fur further away from, from the capital city or from, from Grand Lodge itself, from Hamilton. So it's, it's, uh, it's important to engage them because I don't think it's fair to consistently ask a lodge or a specific lodge, I should say, to consistently pay to send representation to have their voices heard. So I think we might see a hybrid model in the coming years that allows for that. My only concern, and I think that's what everyone's concern is, will that lead to the degradation and eventual um, end of in-person communication? I, I think as brothers, as Masons, as humans, we are social creatures. We, are, we crave personal contact. So don't think that would happen naturally. It would, would have to be forced. I think we would naturally want to have a meet. Uh, it just might end up less people showing up. Um, so the, the, the short answer would be, uh, let's find a way to include lodges or areas of the jurisdiction that don't feel they get fair representation. Um, and one of the ways that, that that's been talked about is creating this sort of regional board position, if you will. I don't know if you've heard speak of this, um, but rather than having, say, you know, every every year you're electing five members of the board, um, every area or district or whatever subdivision, however it's decided to be to be managed, would would send a represent, representative to the board. So you'd have a DDGM plus a member of the board. Uh, and so 
you, you're not necessarily you're not always going to have a bunch of people who can make it to Grand Lodge and travel all where all the uh, the greatest density of lodges are to get their name out there and to and to get known so that they can get elected. We can drill it down back to the the smaller communities and and uh, definitely target them for specific input if they're represented at that kind of um, level or in that measure. Uh, again, these are these are debates that are are to be had in, in Grand Lodge, but I think they they need to move forward. We can't we can't sit back on our heels and say, well, this is the way we've done it for a millennia. Well. 150 or you know 300 years 150 years where wherever you're setting the line right How, however long we've been around grand lodge or, or or the craft itself uh you know so just because that's the way we've done it all the time doesn't mean that that's the most effective way to do it today so um so i think you'll see some change coming i think with the introduction introduction of uh technology uh this year we're gonna see uh, either younger brethren, and when I say younger brethren, I don't mean in age, I mean uh, younger to the craft, so more inexperienced brethren, looking for leadership positions. Um, we have uh, generational concepts, uh, you know, we, we talk about millennials all the time that are a little bit more seeking immediate gratification, whatever, you know, however they, they uh, seek to do that, whether that means I want to be a Grand Lodge officer the day after I, I get my third degree, that sort of uh, mentality, or if, you know, we just need to sit down and talk more, but, but agree to make action from, from those conclusions. Um, well, our, you know, that brings up a good question and it is something that has been discussed uh, either directly or, or indirectly on, on this podcast, both in this series and, and, with numerous guests, um, the the instant gratification um, desire, or or the the seeming uh, desire, you know, there's been a lot of um, uh, public figures and and the derisive term might be influencers, but a lot of um, and and the the more positive term would be. Um, you know, the authors or psychologists or, or different people in the social media and more generally public sphere who have been really emphasizing um, the, the benefits and the value of, of struggle and of taking on things that are challenging um, and that result in gratification, but delayed, you know. Uh, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, Jocko, Jocko, uh, oh, Jocko Willing? Wilkinson, Will uh, Wilkinson. Yeah, I think it's Jocko. Willick. I don't, I don't yeah, want to get his Willink, name right. Willinks, I think. Willinks, Willinks. The Navy SEAL. You're talking yeah. about the famous podcaster. Yeah, yeah. He'll beat the shit out of me if he finds out I yeah. spelled his, got his name <laughs> wrong. The uh, Jocko, David Goggins. There's even a new new book out. Um, uh, can't remember the author's name, but it's called The Comfort Crisis, basically emphasizing that we've grown too comfortable. Um, you know, and this is something I discussed I, very recently. You know, it seems to me that Freemasonry, in its not, and this isn't a Grand Lodge critique, this is a Freemason in general critique, uh, in its advertisements or its attempts to gather members, it's really emphasized the, the enjoyable aspects of the craft, you know, the immediate enjoyment of getting new members and the fun of that. And also the idea of, of the convenience of the craft. We've all heard the joke, it's only one night a month or, you know, you don't need to sacrifice work and family for it, things like that. Um, but it seems to me that a lot of millennials and men uh, are really craving a, a, a message of sacrifice and of struggle and of you know, trying something difficult and, you know, uh, expectations and responsibility and things that perhaps are in Freemasonry, but are not emphasized because we're afraid that may scare people off or scare men off. I, I, I'm glad you, you pointed that out because this seems to drive right down uh, 
another book speaking of sort of literary i think easter is the the uh, uh author you're thinking of but uh christopher easter esther easter um say what you will about the man uh, jordan peterson if you've read his book uh, 12 rules uh he, he talks about that life and satisfaction that men get is from sacrificing and doing you know the good deed uh, however you define that deed, but, but working for family, um, working hard, that delayed gratification. And he does use those words, delayed gratification, which is, uh, you know, in, in, in political science, we, you know, we use terms like, uh, the Protestant work ethic, which is a little bit, you know, um, exclusive now, uh, the reality is work hard, put money into your business now, uh, take the rewards later, right? Delayed gratification. So we don't, I, I think we're, I personally, it's just a, a feeling uh, on, based on some anecdotal current evidence that we're going to see a resurgence, not just because I want to, but because I think that this, even though we've connected on social media and many people, even outside of masonry have done this, I think it's helped emphasize how much we miss that contact and as, as as much as that whole stiff upper lip and you know i i can remember my grandfather once saying okay derek you're at the age now that uh we don't hug anymore it's a handshake right so i think i was 12 13 and i papa was like handshakes you know i still steal a hug from the man come on um but uh um we we kind of grow up and we have to be stoic and we don't we don't show emotion and yeah yeah yeah, yeah all these other sort of social constructs of what it is to be a man or a husband or a father. But the reality is what we're taking away or we're neglecting is personal contact is that man time, right? I, I, I think it's, I think it's constructive for a man to be away from the home for a little while. I don't, I don't think going out every night without your spouse, you know, we're never home um, is, is healthy for the marriage. I think, uh, but that decision is to be made between, you know, you know, consenting adults. But uh, the reality is, I think we miss each other. And I think from the interest that I've seen from applicants uh, to the craft, uh, most of them are coming in through social media anyway, for, to us. I mean, we're getting some through referrals, if you will, but most people are just outright picking up the phone and calling Grand Lodge or on the email, you know, saying, hey, uh, I'm interested. How do I do this? Um, so I can think of, you know, six guys off the top of my head that have, that are prospective members. So either we come up with a virtual way of conferring degrees, or we've got to get back to lodge soon, because if we're not engaging them, we're going to lose them. Uh, and so the great thing about, uh, again, about Zoom and, and go to whatever these, these meeting platforms is we can bring these guys in. And because the meetings are not tiled, they're they're not really missing anything they're not being asked to leave they're not being told you got to wait to get into lodge uh if there's any kind of education that borders on um you know um sorry this this might be a little bit uh outside of your your pay grade if you will then then they're asked to leave but that doesn't that doesn't happen very often uh, lodges are having uh virtual business meetings and then trying to conduct some sort of education and uh, that can be done that, you know, outside the tiled recesses of a lodge. So they're getting exposure. They're getting to meet us uh, in in social circles uh, before they join. And so this uh, group dynamic of you know coming together, meeting, and and storming, and figuring out am I good am I a good fit for this organization, and the organization figuring out if I'm a good fit for for them uh, is happening in real time. It's not just uh, you know, often a lodge might have uh, a candidate come out um, for a social evening, uh, a brother to brother night or something, or sorry, a friend to friend night or some, some social organ uh, socially organized event. Uh, and then they get an interview and then, you know, this, these one off things months and months apart, uh, you know, we're meeting every week and these guys are still coming out and we just had a candidate. I mean, he hasn't even been initiated yet. 
Um, I don't even know if we've accepted his uh, petition yet, to be honest. I mean, we can't anyway, you know, we can't read it out and watch, but uh, uh, he, he just did uh, the education bit, you know, he said, uh, can, can we talk about something? Um, you know, sure. Uh, what do you want to talk about? X, Y, and Z. Cool. Can do a presentation. Sure. There you go. So now he's, he's involved in that, right? So he, he feels connected uh, to the brethren because he's sharing knowledge and information that he has, and he's not even an entered apprentice yet. So that's just one example. Um, we, we just need to find a way to make it, uh, to, uh, yeah, to fit it all together so we can still meet, but, you know, in perhaps in times, perhaps over the summer, there's nothing stopping us nowadays once the Lodge gets back in that, that, you know, when we're not meeting in the summer, we can still have a meeting if we miss the brethren, but, uh, you know. Will um, that, um, you know, the, the, the virtual um, component of, well, I was going to say Freemasonry, but of just, just life in general, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, it's very hard to see, in my opinion, the, well, uh, how do I put this? Like, uh, uh, I, I do believe it, it's, it was and is necessary that, that the Grand Lodge move to the virtual Grand Lodge, move to the virtual go-to meetings and bring these things online simply because it's not, you know, it just wasn't possible or safe uh, uh, to meet in person. Um, so credit to Grand Lodge for that. Uh, and, you know, it has opened up opportunities to meet with brethren from outside the jurisdiction that you never would have met with otherwise. Uh, the the go-to meeting I, I was on last night, uh, we had uh, the Grand Lodge meet and greet to, organized by the Education Committee. 500 people online, 500. You know, do we get that many in Grand Lodge uh, voting? I, I think we get a few more, but they're all from Toronto area right or or you know southern ontario uh here everybody has the opportunity to dial in you know so but um, the yeah. the danger of of and it's a danger that i don't know how how like it's very difficult to see how you avoid this danger um is and what concerns me is you know the nice thing about online is it's much more of a convenience for uh, somebody to attend you know you don't have to wear pants yeah, uh, yeah. you know i i know you know you you can schedule time around it so you know you don't have to worry about things like child care you don't have to worry about you know the, what i think back to is i don't know if you've ever read the book and this came out in 1998 well before social media per se uh, it was i don't think any myspace maybe at the time i don't know but uh it was I think it was 98. It was Bowling Alone by Robert Putman. Yeah, I know um, the author. I'm not sure if I read the book, though. Yeah. But, so yeah. it was about the, the declining numbers uh, in civic organizations, Freemasons, Elks, whatever it might be. And, and even then, it was a significant decline. But he also pointed out that where you saw membership increase was, um, for lack of a better term, you know, paper membership. So that those were, for example, Greenpeace groups where you didn't have any meetings or stated responsibilities. It was simply a matter of filling out a, a membership form and sending it in and you got a card uh, and, you know, you paid whatever the, the fee was, but you didn't actually have any particular responsibilities toward it beyond the payment of things. Um, and you point out that people liked those because it was the extent to which they were involved was completely at their convenience and they could schedule things around it. You know, when we go back to, um, you know, a, a situation where it's, okay, at this time you need to be at this place, which means you need to think about taking time off of work. You need to wear a suit and tie. You need to make the commute. You need to get childcare. You know, have we, have we started training our membership to, um, you know, view Freemasonry as a, as a, a institution of convenience, even more so than before, as opposed to an institution of responsibility. That's a great, that's a great point. And I, and I think it's a, a pitfall to be avoided. I think uh, you, you hit it right on the head is, is we can communicate, we can use these tools. It's just a tool, but when it becomes the means 
uh, you know, the ends and the means, then, then um, we've lost it. It's certainly in that sort of characterization, uh, it does not fairly describe what it is that we're looking to foster or the type of person that we want in the craft. We want people who take time out of their day to uh, commune with like-minded people, uh, to talk to them and uh, do good for the community. Um, we talk about it in masonry all the time. Um, I, I, I talk about it when I talk about volunteering. Um, most people have one of three things, sometimes two, right? But rarely all three, money, time, and resources, right? So if you are a well-to-do philanthropist, you might be a busy person. You don't have a lot of time, but you might have a lot of money and a cause you believe in. So, and, and you're probably a successful business person if you have that sort of disposable income that you can throw at a, you know, a worthy cause. So you can put money and you can dedicate your resources to that. If you're not that well off, how do you participate either in making an organization successful or in um, participating in it you give your time, you know, um, it, it's interesting that, uh, most, uh, um, fundraisers in, in, in charity will tell you most of the money they get is the 20 and 30 bucks they get from mom and pop these $10 million donations. They're few and far between, and they take a lot of courting and all that sort of stuff. But, the bulk of the money they get every year is you and me sending a check for 20, 30 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever it is these days, but a minimal amount. So it's the same thing in, in masonry. Do you want uh, people just mailing in the, the basic amount? That's where everybody's going to be. Uh, that's the minimum. Some people in every organization, it, it's always a handful that are that dedicate a lot of their time. So they don't have a lot of money, but they have either a lot of time or desire and of their resources, perhaps they have a set of skills uh, to organize or, or whatever. So, so they give time. So I think you could think of any organization, whether it's your lodge, Boy Scouts, uh, what other organization it is, it's always, you can count them on one hand uh, in lodge, the people that are there every day or every month, whatever it is, that volunteer or organize the committees that do this, do that, whatever. You can always count on a handful of people. The rest of the people will give you some time, some money, some resources, but not all of it all the time. Um, so it, it, it's a trapping we need to avoid in the sense that we don't want to encourage that to be the standard. We don't want people just sort of mailing it in. I'd rather your efforts and time than your money, to be quite honest, because I could probably double, uh, I could probably monetize your effort better than you just reaching in your pocket and giving me what, what pocket change you have, if you will. Um, so yeah, you're right. We definitely, we need to incorporate tech, but we also got to make sure that that's, that's not how, that's not going to be our business model. It shouldn't be. Uh, we've survived. 300 years plus um without the bottom line there's people you know there's they pay their dues every year you never see them in lodge yep and that's just like you're saying right i send you money i'm in the organization that's all i want to do okay um but there's an opportunity for you to participate more and more and more as you desire right and that's the great thing about volunteer organizations you get out what you put into it um but yeah so you'll see uh I guarantee you, you look at your lodges, three, four people, maybe that, that, that you see them all the time, everywhere you can count them, you know, day in and day out. So, um, yeah. Well, this is after all the, uh, candidates series. So you should definitely go in that direction. Uh, at some point sure. you are, um, a candidate for 2021 grand lodge. Talk about your, the position for which you are a candidate and also um, what made you, um, well, you're nominated, but what, what made you, why is it that you're, our sta you're standing for the position um, for which you were nominated? So um, 
obviously a great question. Um, let me just pull up some notes here. I made some notes here, so I don't lose my train of thought here. So, um, Grand Senior Warden is one of those few positions that um, the incumbent is encouraged or expected to do at least some ritual. Uh, anybody that knows me or seen me in Lodge knows that I, I take ritual fairly seriously. I really enjoy it. Uh, and I, and I believe in delivering a high quality experience to candidates and visitors. And I demand that from others. And, and like I say, because it's, it's an office where you can do that. If you were running for DDGM or, or a number of the other offices, uh, you're strictly forbidden from doing any ritual work, but the grand senior warden does some work in, uh, particularly in, in installations. Right. And so the other thing is that while they're as a grand senior warden, you can you can travel to official visits, right? Because you're not going to outrank the DDGM, so so you have this ability to to see a lodge well whenever you want, I suppose, uh, at at whatever the uh, grandmaster um, dictates. But also, um, typically a lodge, you know, have two at least two formal meetings a year, an installation and a and a, um, an official visit. You can attend both of those. So, so that's something I really like because I really like uh, attending installations. Um, and the other thing is because I don't live in my district, uh, Ontario is an interesting spot these days that you don't have to physically live in the district where you uh, are a member of the lodge. Uh, this was a bigger deal years and years ago when travel was much more difficult. But nowadays, you know, we commute a lot, right? So this allows me to be a little bit more versatile and apply um, my efforts further abroad or further afield than just in a single district. Um, Why well, get involved in Grand Lodge? Uh, I, I have a motto and it is to lead is to serve. So uh, I, I think many candidates if not and i from what i heard last night i think we all sort of say, uh, share that that view that i've enjoyed this very much it's time for me to give back i want to give back i want to be a part of this uh, but i also want to take a, a leadership or mentorship role uh, above what it is to be a master or past master in lodge so um here's an opportunity to do it and uh you know and represent the organization uh, to the best of your ability, or in my, my case, in my ability, right? Um, the, yeah, and yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, you brought up the, you know, a, a grand senior warden position, or the grand senior warden position. Um, it's it's a fascinating position, uh, as are a few others at the Lodge or Grand Lodge level, in the the, the ceremonial nature of, of the position um, it, and, and kind of there's, there's a, a broadness to it in the sense that you really do have freedom to, so the ceremonies are the ceremonies and those are set, um, mm -hmm. but you are still at a, a high ranked position in which, um, you know, you can bring ideas forward behind the scenes or you, you have the capacity to to add a lot to a lodge by your presence and to encourage things that you think are important to the craft. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember when I became worship master for the first time, you're trying to figure out how to, how to sit in the chair and how to do that job. And, you know, somebody told me, um, you know, you can be as busy or as not busy as you want to be as a worshipful master, because really, you know, you have your ceremonial duties and those are pretty much set relatively in stone, but then you have the administration and the, your role as kind of a leader in the craft and that is wide open to you to do with it whatever you want. That's something I think is so interesting about a ceremonial, quote unquote, ceremonial position is there actually is a lot of authority and, and influence invested in those positions. Yeah, so if you compare it to uh, to other positions, right? So a grand senior warden, though he doesn't have like an air, a specific area of responsibility um, that allows him to to apply 
the balance of his administrative efforts to as the Grand Master sees fit in, in whatever that, whether that's uh, sitting on a committee or advising or doing whatever it is that Grand Master and Grand Lodge require of them. Um, and so here you have this ceremonial piece uh, and the bulk of your work is as required. And that's going to happen at the Grand Lodge level. Uh, whereas if you're, say, a, a district deputy grandmaster, the bulk of your work is administering the district with very little ceremonial uh, responsibilities, right? I mean, obviously, you there's the uh, there's a catechism back and forth in the openings and closings, and and um, the final part there in the uh, in the installation, right? Uh, but uh, you're really tied up with the district, right? Uh, which isn't a bad thing. It's it's how you choose to serve and 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 where you think your skills lie, right? Uh, it's not it's not a position I would shy away from either. But uh, so so that's what you have. So you have lots of ceremony uh, opportunity to travel uh, and help out as required, or um, do a lot of administration and a little bit of ritual. Um, I'm, I'm not scared of either one, but. Uh, I think if you ask anybody who's run for Grand Senior Warden or Grand Junior Warden, there's a reason they they ran for one or the other. Uh, mine is the Senior Warden's lecture just happens to be one of my favorite pieces, uh, more so than, say, the Junior Warden or, or, or whatever. Uh, of a couple other pieces, if they were offices, I'd probably run for them too. But, or you know, but uh, um, yeah, it's just, uh, I just like the chair. I like the work. Um, and it, it leaves an opportunity, uh, like I said, I'm repeating myself for and over here, but it leaves an opportunity to uh, more flexibility, in, in my opinion. Um, yeah. Do you, um, you know, or, or, or this is a, a unique year. We touched on it throughout this interview, right? This Grand Lodge is the, the first ever Grand Lodge to be not only you know, completely virtual, but even to incorporate virtual, uh, you know, we've never incorporated electronic voting mm -hmm. before. And now we're going to have, have our voting and our Grand Lodge be completely uh, virtual, again, for, for good reason. Um, are you, you know, to, to what extent are you looking forward to Grand Lodge and this change? Do you see it sticking around some form of incorporating the virtual and electronic with in-person meetings? Um, I, and... I would, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, let me cut you off. No, no, just, yeah, that's the question. Go ahead. Oh, um, yeah, I'm, I really enjoy meeting and talking to people. I really do. Um, new people, new stories. Uh, always fascinating to hear things like why someone chose to join the craft, what, what first got them interested. Most people remember that. Most people remember the moment they walked into lodge and what they felt for the very first time. Um, I still remember that 20 plus years later as if it was yesterday. Um, and I also appreciate that there may not be as effective representation with a centralized government uh, that one would expect or desire. So, that, so that's got to there has to be a way to engage brethren uh, to at least participate in the government of Grand Lodge uh, without asking them to be unfairly asking sorry without asking them to put out more money or more resources than is required, say, of a brother who, who lives five minutes walking distance from the Royal York Hotel, that, that sort of thing. And that's that's just the ceremony, right? Like Grand Lodge exists 365. Uh, the ceremonial and the business, big business part of it happens once a year, but the putting out fires, the management, that happens all year round, right? Um, difficult to do from a remote location, can happen now more with technology so i think you might see more management happening you know more committee meetings happening virtually this will probably facilitate that participation from brethren who are further away from from the central location and um maybe we still have to say you still got to get to grand lodge to 
to vote. I, I, I don't know. I, I think for me, the biggest thing is, are we losing or not getting enough participation at Grand Lodge? Because, you know, they're just the the metric is how many people show up to vote. Um, and, um, and, and I'd like to see more of that, you know, the proverbial, a lodge or a district gets a, a bus together and they put everybody on the bus and, and ship them into town, you know, is, is three days in the middle of the week, easy to do for brethren who have families and jobs. Right. So we've, we've lived and existed with this for, you know, over 150 years. So don't think it's necessarily going to change um, that we're going to have an annual communication. Um, and, and we'd actually have to change the constitution in order to make that happen anyway. So we are re uh, required by the constitution to have an annual communication. So, so let's keep up with that. Let's just find a way to get more brethren interested and find a way that we can, like, I don't think anybody's against, Hey, let's go to Thunder Bay this year. Let's go to, uh, Van Cleet Hill, you know, uh, or, or Cornwall or wherever. Right. Uh, it's an opportunity to, to see the province, to travel, to meet people. Um, it, it, it's funny. I've traveled all over the world. I've traveled all over this country and you would be surprised how many people have never left their hometown. Uh, so when someone from a faraway land notices or, or, you know, meets you and finds out that you're Canadian and then they have some connection to some obscure place that's not Toronto, you can't speak authoritatively about it. But if you've traveled there, if you have family there, uh, if you've lived there, uh, that, that gives you an opportunity to speak more to the character of everybody, right? Uh, the, you know, the regional um, idiosyncrasies that we all have. Um, you have that opportunity. So uh, travel is always good for education and education is good for social causes. So let's get, let's find a way to get more people out. And if we have to move Grand Lodge around, maybe we have to move Grand Lodge around. Again, that's something that we go to uh, a committee for. And if we have to change the constitution to do that, then we change the constitution to do that. If that's the desire of the brethren. So I, I, I'm speaking of my own opinion. Do I think that needs to happen? Probably. Um, but if the majority of brethren are happy with the way the things they are, the thing, sorry, the way things are, then, then we don't change it. Right. Um, but I, I think gives, we're, uh, we're ready for a change. Sorry, go ahead. You know, and, and it would also give um, Masons at the district level, a chance to, to promote and show off their, their towns. Um, you know, you could have, um, you know, a Grand Lodge could, for example, take, uh, um, and this was, was an idea I've floated around before in this podcast. Um, you know, a, they, they, Grand Lodge could invite, um, a, invite applications from different districts. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Ottawa district, Windsor or Essex district. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I forget and, what the Thunder Bay district a... is can always do a business analysis beforehand. Right. And it doesn't have to be that, that in depth. It's not, you know, organizing a big event, uh, it's not reinventing the wheel. Right. Yeah. And, and you know, come, come, come to our town, there. come to our, our city. Yeah. Uh, we've got and all these things to offer. Another you know, body, uh, I'm involved in one of the things that, that you have to do when you host it, cause it rotates all over the place is you have to have work in a tour of something, uh, mechanical something of of engineering significance so if it's a tour of let's say we're in vegas the hoover dam let's say cn tower but you know you want to tour somebody who can speak to the the engineering marvel if you will uh, the the warplane museum in hamilton that sort of thing right here's these machines let's go look at them so you plan these outings and shrine does that as well right you have the ladies night you know and we do that in grand lodge as well we we plan social activity for our spouses we're not leaving them out of it and i and i do believe that uh outside of sitting in lodge 
I, I think we should try and our, incorporate our families a bit more and that makes them less resentful. That, that makes that, that sort of silly old joke about only going to lodge once a month uh, it becomes moot because it's like, well, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think every, almost every spouse uh, wants to get dressed up at least once a year uh, and wants their uh, husband, their, their mason, to to show them off put on a gown put on your tails put on a tux whatever get dressed up let's go let's have a banquet let's you know what i mean like let's stop plastic spoon and paper plating this let's have a good solid you know interaction which is what the grand lodge banquet does uh which is what a number of districts do every year that's fine you want to have a fish fry let's go have some fun but i think i think the ladies really appreciate getting getting dressed up so um so that's just one way to include the families but um yeah if you go to a town they can, you can show off the town uh and you would actually even out the the disparities so so if every region gets an equal representation say over a 10-year span right um that way if um the meeting is on the in the opposite end of the province where way more people have to travel to go. That's the other consideration. The volume of brethren is around the GTA or within an hour's drive or two hours drive. So it doesn't it doesn't as many people are not traveling. If you move it like, you know, up to Algonquin Park, then everybody's got to travel to go up there. Um I don't think that's a problem. Just find a, a venue that can that can support it and, and, and let's make it happen but um it also means that the people that are always traveling you know one one trip's going to be a bridge too far so next year when you have the grand lodge in their jurisdiction that previous jurisdiction might not by jurisdiction i mean district sorry uh, might not get good representation but that's okay because it'll even out in the medium to long term so i think you'll see less of this trying to remember whose turn is it for this office um you know we, we do this thing with the grand senior warden and grand junior warden so what happens when you have something like covid where now you're a year you're excluded for a year so what do you do you fall back on the previous year what happens when there, there's no candidate this year like just vote for the guy you think's the best person for the job that's how i've always approached it and i'll always say don't vote for me just to vote for me vote vote your conscience but the important part is just get out and vote then then you get to have a say in in what happens in grand lodge uh, and that vote. is that is a very good place i think to leave it you know vote your conscience vote um vote for what you think is best but most importantly just take the time to vote. This is the first year you can do it virtually, so you don't even need to wear pants. <laughs> well, uh, you do need to register, right? Like, it's a, a little bit more, right? It's not just the secretary sending off your names this year, so so we have to remember to register. And uh, Yes, and, and the registration is in June. June, uh, check the description to this video, but June 12th, if I recall correctly. The, yeah, the a couple days, I think. Yeah, yeah, there's a window um, yeah, yeah, in yeah. June um, to register. If you haven't I've mentioned this a few times, you know, and as a secretary, I will, I will say, you know, make sure you're checking, brethren, you're checking your emails, not just your, uh, your main folder, but your junk folder too, because sometimes the little robots um, will end up throwing stuff there that ought not to be there. And you might, uh, you might miss the rules and, and regulations and, and the procedures, especially this year, because it is so different on how to vote. Yeah and the process and you can check the description to this video as well but um yeah just there, just... there was a communique sent out it's available on the grand lodge website under what's new i believe yeah um yeah so you should have got something at least the secretary should have got something from the district secretaries which would have been pushed down through the grand lodge communications that there is we a... did we did and yeah i got mine and i sent it off every everybody should have, should have had it it's um yeah, I found using Google Drive works really well because um, you can put it in a Google Drive and then put a link in your email and then people can just click on the link and then they have access to, yeah. to anything in that folder. 
So I'll kind of all, I, I try to put all the communications from Grand Lodge uh, in there. But however That's it's done, idea. just make sure uh, uh, secretary send it out, but then, you know, membership, check your emails regularly. Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, it's reasonable businesses are using emails now as official communication, right? So, and flipping an email is considered official communication these days. So yeah, if Grand Lodge says, you know, like you say, check your emails, check your spam, it's, it's reasonable. I, you know, you might not get it in the mail this year. <laughs> so absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and with that, I always forget to mention this, but um, if you like this video, like, subscribe, comment, I got Patreon, all that good stuff. Um, yeah, this again is the seventh interview I've done. There's, there's been one every day this week going back. So make sure you check those regularly. And um, you know, they're all under the 2021 Grand Lodge candidate series. Uh, and I'm still waiting on a few more responses but i should have a few more coming out in the in the coming days uh, is my hope and once again open invitation to all candidates and with that thank you so much for being here uh i appreciate your time very much thanks for your time cameron it's been a it's been a pleasure and uh, yeah that was a really fast turnaround i appreciate uh, getting back to me so soon and uh, no worries at to all. doing many more of these